Hey everyone, I'm Brandon Conkle, and today I want to talk to you about Nakago, my new Rust API framework for sharp services with a solid foundation. I've been an engineer for over 15 years now, focusing on the web on the back and the front end, and I've really come to appreciate Rust in recent years, uh, just because it has such a great combination of features that approach the problem of chaos and unpredictability uh, in a unique way that's really effective. I think there are some really uh, exciting applications for Rust in a number of different areas. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about what I'm excited about for backend uh, API service development with Rust. I think Rust brings just the right combination of features together to really help tame that chaos that I see in backend development and, and really help us get towards that determinism that I'm always striving for. The idea that in every situation, no matter what, you know exactly how your system is going to behave. It's going to behave consistently consistently uh, based on the inputs and you're always going to get the same consistent output, you can predict exactly how it's going to behave and you don't get surprises and um, really gnarly production bugs uh, because you do some extra work up front to work with the type system to help it guarantee that you can't get in these bad situations. Uh, and I think that Rust is really uniquely poised to, to really change backend development for the better, giving us really outstanding performance and a rich type system um, on top of this uh, really strong approach towards ownership and borrowing and um, things that I'll get into in a minute. But uh, I, I think that the one limitation right now is that the ecosystem is still um, not very mature yet. There, um, a lot of the early leaders in the Rust web space um, really gained prominence before Tokyo took off as uh, the, the prominent leader in the async runtime space. So um, async await is relatively new in Rust, and it's a uh, syntactic wrapper around some low-level um, futures and uh, state machines around waiting for futures and whether they've completed or not. Uh, and it, re it really only... Uh, landed in recent years. And so Tokyo is a runtime um, that provides abstractions around that, that provides um, a task system that uh, distributes tasks optionally or potentially across multiple threads. And it's really efficient. It's a really great way, I think, to manage um, async tasks uh, in a predictable way. And so the the tools that are built on top of, of Tokyo with Tokyo in mind are still pretty fresh. They're still um, starting to emerge, but I think we're really seeing some great progress. So the thing that's missing, though, I think, is the kind of framework experience that I've had the pleasure of enjoying in uh, projects like uh, Django in the Python programming language. I think that uh, it was a great way for organizing application structure and especially the, the object relational mapper for SQL access was just uh, outstanding in how it managed relationships and uh, things like that. Uh, I think in TypeScript, the Nest.js framework um, that really showed me the value of dependency injection and how it really helps free up your testing uh, and makes it easier to isolate your application at different layers and different levels to really thoroughly exercise things and write tests that really provide value. And Rust has all of the pieces for this. We have all of the tools that you would need, uh, but I haven't really seen it put together in a cohesive and effective way like I have in those other language ecosystems. So that was my goal for Nakago, was to bring that, that exceptional customer or developer experience that uh, I've experienced with those other language communities into the Rust world so that we can take advantage of these unique language features that really help us tame this chaos and with the cost of a little added complexity, gain more confidence in our production deployments and um, approach that determinism that I'm always talking about. So what is it that makes Rust so uniquely suited? Let's talk about that next. So these are the features I think really help Rust stand out when it comes to backend API development. And first and foremost among these, I think, are the memory safety and performance together. 
Uh, memory vulnerabilities are a big deal. They make up as much as 80% of all security exploits in the wild, wild according to Google and Microsoft. And uh, it's really difficult for even very seasoned teams of software developers uh, to, to effectively get control of these memory safety vulnerabilities. Um, there are higher level languages out there, Java and Python and JavaScript that um, actually do provide much stronger memory safety because of the way that they tightly control allocation with their garbage collection systems. But the trade-off has traditionally been performance. They don't perform anywhere near as good as low level languages like C and C++ in many situations. And so you typically had to trade off that memory safety for the performance. It was possible to get both in, in languages like C and C++. You could use linting or code based scanning tools um, that would help catch these vulnerabilities. But by all accounts, they were really cumbersome and slow. Uh, they took forever. They and they they missed a lot of cases. They didn't do, uh, they didn't find everything by by any means. And uh, I think Rust really shines because uh, it can much more effectively address the problem of memory safety uh, through its ownership and lifetime system. I think than. Uh, C and C plus plus and even the tools around it can much more efficiently, uh, but without sacrificing the performance, the the kind of optimized memory layouts that they were able to use with the data structures and the standard library and uh, the, their focus on zero cost abstractions, the things, abstractions that wouldn't incur any runtime cost, that it would always be in the build phase. Um, I think there's really helped it uh, really achieve outstanding performance. I think the, the performance of the compiled binary in some cases has even been able to rival that of hand tuned assembly. Uh, I know that's not every case, but I've definitely seen cases where just the default rust without a whole lot of time spent on optimization can, can stand toe to toe with this hand tuned assembly implementation. It's really exceptional. Uh, and I think the ownership and lifetime system that it uses to achieve this um, is really outstanding. It's something that you don't see in many other language systems. Um, that it helps you avoid garbage collection entirely, and so you don't have those like mark and sweep pauses. Um, it tightly controls the allocation and when things can access that memory and when they can change that memory. You won't see things being mutated out from underneath you when you weren't expecting it. Um, it really gives you a lot of strong tools to address these problems of chaos and unpredictability, uh, but with escape hatches where you need them, with synchronization primitives like mutexes that are really effective or reference counters so that you can um, of, you can use garbage collection when you need it, but in a way that cooperates with the ownership and lifetime tracking system. And so it, it, you still don't have the mark and sweep problem. Um, it, it's really got some amazing tools to help you uh, approach these problems in new ways that I haven't seen in other language communities. And at the same time, it has this really sound high level type system that the strictness is really uh, something that I appreciated about it. Um, it gives you all the tools that you need to build these solid abstractions that are easy to work with. It gives you um, useful interfaces and traits with associated types. It gives you everything you need for fearless concurrency and multi-threading with async await uh, syntax. And it, it helps guard against a variety of different ways that you can shoot yourself in the foot. And it takes a little bit of extra effort to work with the compiler uh, because the compiler is really aggressive. There are cases where it would probably be fine, but the compiler can't prove that it's fine. And so it doesn't let you do it. And that's a good thing because you want to rely on things that are provably um, stable, provably consistent uh, to achieve that determinism that I'm always talking about. Uh, and along with all this, it, you don't have to adopt it wholesale. You can adopt it piecemeal because the, the interoperability with other language ecosystems is really um, something that they focused heavily on. There are a lot of tools for embedding Rust into other languages as binary modules with tools for binding to external interfaces and uh, it, using uh, calling foreign functions and things like that. It has a great set of tools to help play well with others. And I think that's why you've seen um, Rust be embedded in things like the Linux kernel and the uh, Android operating system because it plays so well with others. 
So my goal with Nakago is to give you a set of effective tools that really makes it a lot easier to take advantage of those unique properties of the Rust programming language and really help boost your um, API development in Rust. Uh, and it does this by bringing together a lot of different tools, a lot of third party tools that already exist, uh, but also I think adding some really important tools uh, that didn't exist in Rust to help you take advantage of them uh, in a structured application lifecycle a lot easier. Uh, so first and foremost, it's built around Tokyo and the Tokyo async ecosystem. I think uh, the Tokyo runtime is exceptional. It is an outstanding way to manage async and concurrency uh, in a way that can um, manage tasks effectively, potentially on multiple threads, uh, and just does a great way of coordinating those tasks and uh, <clears throat> abstracting away a lot of the, the higher level things that an async runtime needs. Uh, but one thing that I haven't seen uh, really tightly integrated with uh, Tokyo's async model uh, is dependency injection. Um, I've seen some kind of rudimentary approaches to dependency injection in Rust, uh, but nothing that was async enabled, uh, I think, in the way that the Nakago's dependency injection container is. Uh, I think it really does provide a great um, underpinnings for managing your application's dependency lifecycle and loading things effectively and um, injecting flexible dependencies for different situations really easily without having to think about it too much uh, and giving you the tools to kind of wrap and integrate with these other tools like Axum and Async GraphQL and CORM um, in ways that make it easy to work with them uh, in the same way together. Uh, and then it also wraps that around a, a nice application lifecycle that gives you distinct moments to load dependencies, to initialize services, to start your application and then clean up when it's closing. Uh, and does that in a way that makes everything really cleanly testable, it gives you uh, the tools with that dependency injection to really isolate your dependencies well uh, and give you all the, the levers that you need to manage your testing and, and validate that functionality in useful ways to write tests that provide a lot of value to you. And I say it gives a solid foundation because I have a really strong appreciation for the solid principles out of object-oriented architecture. Uh, and for some of you that know me, this may be surprising because I've spent a good portion of my career uh, very heavily focused on functional programming and some of the alternative approaches that it provides. Uh, but I think in languages like Rust, uh, the solid principles make a lot of sense in uh, helping to organize your application in an effective and flexible way, um, especially when it comes to dependency management and organizing your dependencies. So the S in single or solid stands for the single responsibility principle. So each piece should have own a single distinct aspect of functionality. Uh, and I, I think that really helps with organization that you're not doing too many things in one place. So breaking, breaking your applications down into distinct and predictable components is really important. And Nakago helps you do that and manage traits effectively. Um, the open and closed principle is the O in solid. Uh, and that says that components should be open to extension, closed to modification. Uh, and to me, that means that we need to have a lot of extensibility points. There needs to be a lot of ways to customize the functionality without having to go in and fork the code and make changes to the module itself. Uh, this really helps uh, long term with refactoring. If you don't have to go in and change the original code, code that was already working, if you can extend that code by wrapping it with additional functionality or adding functionality through traits that it's expecting, things like that, um, that really helps you build composable abstractions that, that wrap and extend instead of modify. Um, Liskov substitution, I think, is really important because um, this is the idea that you should prefer dynamic dependencies, that one trait implementer should be substitutable for another. So you shouldn't wait for the a particular concrete implementation of trait, but you should accept any implementer of that trait. And that makes your applications more loosely coupled. They, they can be more decoupled. You can compose them and swap things out much more easily, and it helps you um, isolate dependencies during testing. Um, I think inter interface segregation is really important too. The, that's the idea that many specific in interfaces are better than a really large, big general in interface that does everything. Uh, and the underlying idea behind it is that traits shouldn't have methods that implementers don't need. 
So divide things up into logical ways and only give um, only give your implementers the the methods that they really need to implement it for this particular trait. Split it split it up so you're not doing too much at once. Uh, and then dependency inversion really ties into that dependency injection system where um, high level components shouldn't be concerned with those trait implementation details. They shouldn't be concerned with which implementer of this trait that it's using. It shouldn't be concerned with how those dependencies are initialized. They should just accept the dependencies and work with them. Uh, and the dependency injection container that Nakago provides really gives you uh, strong tools to, to implement that and to make that a reality in a usable way. All right, so I've talked a lot about it. Uh, let's go ahead and pull up the tutorial now and actually run through uh, getting a really simple API application up and running uh, and, and go through the steps that it would take to add really simple JWKS, JWT authentication uh, and a, a username endpoint that would let you see, um, let you make use of that JWT payload. Uh, so first I'll pull up the tutorial and then I'll pull up my code base and walk through um, what is involved in a Nakago application and um, how you could begin building on it. Okay, the first step is to pull up the Nakago.dev site and view the tutorial. Use the tool called Cargo Generate to bootstrap a new project based on Nakago simple template. This template spins up a simple HTTP API application using Nakago and Axum. Looking at the file tree view of the project's folder structure, you'll see a main entry point an initialization routine, a config, and some HTTP handlers. Pull up your new README file and follow the instructions to set up the project. This will involve setting up some dependencies so that you can successfully build your new application. Once you have the cargo make run command executing successfully, you're ready to continue the tutorial and begin to wire in authentication. The first step in the application lifecycle is the load phase, which is where you should provide any dependencies or config loaders necessary to initialize and start the app. The config is loaded during this phase so that it will be available during the init and startup phases that follow. Add the auth config property to the existing config struct from the template, and then add some fake auth values to your local config file. You won't need real ones for local integration testing, so you can worry about them later. You're now ready to head over to your initialization routine. This is where you will provide all of the dependencies and lifecycle hooks your app needs in order to start up. Add the providers mentioned in the tutorial, uh, which will add the JWKS keys your config needs, a validator to use in deployed environments, and an Axum extractor that will allow you to easily pull out the subject from your user's token. Now you can follow the tutorial to create a quick Axum route that returns the username from the caller's own token. This example uses the simplest style of Axum integration with a dependency injection aware extractor, but you can also use a controller structure to group handlers together as methods with a common instance that has shared dependencies. You should now be able to spin up your application locally with the new get username route in place. The tutorial goes on to talk about how to set up an integration test to validate the functionality while isolating the test from external dependencies, which is a core focus of the framework. Since this is just a brief look, I'll leave the exercise of getting the tests working to you because I know you'll want to rush to your local command line and try it out today. So hopefully this has been a helpful walkthrough of my approach to Rust API development uh, and how Nakago can make things like dependency management and application lifecycle uh, a lot more easy to manage. Uh, let me know what you think. I'd love to hear your thoughts, your ideas, and feedback. I'm on Mastodon at bconkel at fostodon.org. Uh, you can also reach me at email brandon at conkel.us. Uh, you can see my blog at conkle.us where I have uh, infrequent blog posts that I can hopefully pick up the pace on going forward. Uh, and uh, I'm in the Denver, Colorado area, so you may see me at meetups or other uh, tech events out there. Thank you for watching and for checking out my channel. And I'd love for you to follow or subscribe. I'm planning on posting more about Nakago, about Rust, about common pitfalls like uh, lifetimes across await points in the async world uh, so keep an eye out for more and thanks a look thanks again